I became a firefighter because of the action that's involved. You know, every kid's dream is to be on a fire truck with lights and sirens going through town, you know, running into a burning building, saving lives, and you know, that was a big part of it. No one calls the fire department when you're having a good day. People call the fire department when they're having the worst day of their life. And every time that bell goes off, you get to go and positively affect change in someone's life, usually very quickly. You know, from the second I walked through the door at one of the fire stations where I was going to college, it was obvious that this is what I wanted to do with my life. The job satisfaction there is indescribable. There's a great deal of um, physical exertion that goes into our job. You're wearing a 45 minute air pack, so you're wearing about 50 pounds on your back, another 40 pounds in gear, plus you're carrying a tool, probably another 70 pounds of hose. It's just physically taxing on your body. The number one killer for firefighters is heart attacks. And that's because your heart is just, I mean, you're. In those bunker gear, the heat in your body is, you know, you're supposed to dissipate that heat and sweat. Well, it doesn't go anywhere. It stays in your bunker gear. It's more than just being in shape because there's also um, things that the firefighter is looking at. There is some, some knowledge to it. This is a trade, a professional trade. Well, I ran for mayor specifically um, to deal with the issues of the Town Toyota Center. At the bare bones of it, the city was on the hook for $42 million of debt. The city council um, last year in the budget that they passed um, basically had reoccurring expenses in excess of our revenues by about $800,000. Then I had to make some really difficult decisions. I got this text that said, um, Mayor didn't take our concession package. No surprise there, right? I knew that was going to happen. And then uh, he said he's going to laugh eight. Oh my gosh, <laughs> here we go again, right? I mean, I can't believe that they're taking more from us. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my entire life, was to walk out into that room full of firefighters and police officers and the folks that you, you, you're interviewing and telling them that I have to make a tough decision. We hire really good people, but at the end of the day, if I can't afford to have them, um, you know, I can't afford to have them. It's time to not blow it anymore and start getting us back on a financial path that's, that's doable. 
it's just going to be painful getting there. Money issues has been the big, the big issue facing our department in these times. We've been here 10 years and nothing, we have no new apparatus. The budget's still shrink, shrinking. Our manpower is dwindling. And yet the population is growing. The emergency call volume is growing. So basically, they're asking us to do more with less. We need the right equipment to do our jobs. We need equipment that's going to be reliable. We need equipment that's going to be safe. And it's, it's so bad, I wish you could take this camera back there and film some of it. You can see through some of it. It's thread thin. As far as fighting, finding gear or, or tools and that aspect, we're just going to not be able to breach a door. We're not going to be able to cut a roof. And it, it's frustration on our part as being professionals and trying to do our job, but it's going to hurt the citizen or whoever we're trying to get out of that building more than us. I can't speak to the gear. I can speak to the trucks. We have had a fire truck replacement account. I think a new fire truck's a million and two. We were gaining on it until the Town Toyota Center issue, and then we started borrowing from that, taking money out of that account, to the point that we've got that down to maybe $400,000. Well, that doesn't do that. Our trucks are very old. Our newest fire apparatus is our first out engine is 10 years old. Trucks that old need to be replaced. Our ladder truck has more miles on it than any ladder truck in the entire state of Washington. They're constantly breaking down at fires. And that's an unfortunate thing because that's the only time when they absolutely have to work is when someone's life and property are on the line. We've had several near misses. One of the trucks coming from station two drove all the way to the fire in second gear because it wouldn't shift into the proper gear to drive there fast enough. The first rig there, our first out apparatus, broke down immediately after the fire. So nothing, nothing happened that affected that fire negatively, but it was this close from happening that way. I was at a fire once where three of our trucks broke down. We have one fire truck from this century. They need a new rig, yeah. And I can't pay for one. Right now they're fixing a 1968 snorkel to put down, to put in the basement here downtown. 1968, that's an antique. Yeah, we're trying to get the snorkel put in place right now. I think the staff's working on putting it back in and we'll get it retested and at least have it as a backup rig. The antique fire equipment that we have will and does break down. We have a huge fire problem here. You know, that we run on a fire call, I believe every 66.4 six, hours, I believe, is the fact that the guys just came out with. As a fire department, we're an old city. We have 10-story buildings here. We have assisted living centers. We have retirement homes. We have a 100-year-old downtown core. That is our downtown cores. The build those buildings are 80 to 110 years old. They're made out of a forest of heavy timber. They have sawdust insulation, and many of them have ancient wiring. Those buildings burn. They're going to burn. They're going to keep burning. So we're not going to have, we don't have enough people now to deal with that scenario. We're not going to have enough people even to deal with uh, a single family residence structure fire appropriately. And we're not going to be able to deal with multiple calls. Initially, if we show up right now and we've got three people on a truck, if there is a rescue to be performed, somebody is, they have verified that somebody's inside that house, we can make that rescue immediately. We have three people. If we go down to two on a truck, if there's a verified rescue and we show up to a house fire and there's a woman out front saying, my baby's in that room right there, we're gonna stand there and wait until we get a third person there. It doesn't matter if we get there in 30 seconds. If we don't have enough people on the truck to do our job, we, we have to wait. If two people show up and someone's in there, they can go in and get them out. I, I had a phone call today with a, a firefighter who used to work for the city, who said he took two people out of buildings in his 25-year career, under, and both times it was he and one other guy. I went through with the fire department guys just the other day, and we had a great conversation. They were talking about a fire they were putting out just the other day. 
and they had two in and two out. And I said, so how many bodies were in there that you were trying to get out? How many people were trapped? And they said, no, no, nobody was trapped. They'd all gotten out long before we got in there. I think if there's a person in there, we should go in and get them out. If we're talking about protecting property, we need to do that very safely. We need to protect the homes around it. But I'm more concerned about bodies first and property second and doing that safely. Well, through their, or their own city ordinance, that they like to sue people to clean up their own yards by, we're supposed to have 40 firefighters, one per 800 population. That's, city, that's by in city code, that's city law. And right now we're sitting at 30 uniformed personnel, so we're 10 guys below their own law that was put there for the protection of the citizens and us. And I, it, was, it was originated in 1956, but it was reaffirmed, I believe, in March of 2012. But they're putting us back to paid staff that was here in, the 50, in 1956. Sometimes ordinances become outdated, okay, because things change. Number of officers per thousand, everything I read seems to say that that is the most insignificant of the statistical analysis that one should use. Industry standard is a four-man engine company. Uh, depending on how you read the NFPA, I mean, we should be a nine, minimum of nine guys a shift. And so if you do a nine guys a shift, we do four shifts, that's 36, and plus you need some chief officers. Basically, the citizens of Wenatchee are paying their taxes and they expect fire protection, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna continue paying their taxes and they're not gonna get fire protection. We pay fire insurance to replace things that are lost, replace buildings, furniture, etc. You pay taxes to prevent lives from being lost so that the firefighters can be there at your house or your place of business to protect you or your loved one when you're in a position to potentially lose your life or of grave, grave bodily harm. Now that doesn't necessarily just mean fire, but that's why we pay taxes. And I'm not the only city doing this. You know, I just showed you the Bellingham newspaper where they're going to have to go through major cuts. They did it in Tacoma. They're doing it all over everywhere. This is not an unusual event that's taking place. We have to decide what is government in the business of. Is government in the business of museums? Is it in the business of swimming pools? Is it in the business of hockey stadiums? Or is it in the business of fire departments, police departments? Um, it, is it in the business of providing public works? Is it in the business of uh, beautifying the town at the cost of keeping its citizens safe? And um, where are our priorities?